we have two weeks left of the old SAT. So what I want to do in the next six episodes of Reason Prep Daily is dip into the archives a bit. I'm going to pull out some videos from the Critical Reading Bootcamp and the Math Tactics, Grammar Tactics, an SAT grammar boot or SAT essay bootcamp series that haven't been seen on YouTube. They're in the members area of my website. Members of my site have seen them before, but I'm going to pull them out since hey, old SAT is ending in a couple weeks, and I think the in the last push these videos will help some of you. So in the first video we're going to look at today, we're going to look at pretty commonly request commonly requested uh, question or topic, and that is how do you deal with dual passages on the reading? So what I'm going to do in this video, which comes from the Critical Reading Bootcamp, is go through the strategy for how to tackle dual passage reading questions, and then I'll go through an actual passage from an actual SAT uh, in detail in this video. So it's a pretty long video. I do recommend that you try the passage yourself first before you watch the video. So the passage, I will put information on how to get it uh, in the description of this video below. So go ahead, download that test, do the passage. If you've already done this passage for you know in your practice, it's okay, do it again, and then watch my video and watch how I work through the questions, work through the choices, the order I do the questions, things like that. All right, let me know if you have any questions and let's get into the first video. Now we're moving on to the dual long passages and the dual passages are probably everyone's least favorite. Uh, you've got a lot of reading, probably more reading than any of the other sections, passages in the SAT. And you've got to read two separate passages um, on the same topic, but two separate passages and relate them and answer general questions based off of both of them. So these are a lot of work and they do take a lot of time. And you know, even me, I, I've gotten pretty good at these passages and I can do them pretty quickly. But even still, I look at a dual passage sometimes and I go, ugh, just because it's a lot of work. All right. Uh, but even though it's a lot of work, there is a way to approach it. There is an efficient way uh, to get the most done in the in the uh, least amount of time, and before we go into the example again, let's look at the modified strategy for the dual passages. The first again, read the blurb. Then you do the specific questions for passage one according to the technique we've looked at before. Then you do the general questions for passage one. So once you've done all the specific questions you, and you've read the entire first passage, then go ahead and do any general questions if pop, if if there are any. That's a typo there. Passage, passage, uh, and then. You do uh, the specific questions for passage two, and then the general questions for passage two. And then once you've done all the questions associated with just one passage, then you go ahead and do the dual questions. Uh, and that is going to be the most efficient way to tackle this passage. So let's go ahead and look at a sample. First, the blurb. Both passages discuss the issue of the intelligence of dogs. Passage one was adopted from a 2001 book on animal intelligence. Passage two was written in 2001 by a dog trainer and writer. One note, um, one of the things you want to pay attention to, so again, we talked about the second mind, you always want to read uh, with you know that analysis and that um, interpretation going on in the, in the back of your mind, but when you're doing dual passages, you also want to read and pay attention to the relationship between the passages. So you're not always determining the main idea for passage one and the main idea for passage two and the argument and how they work, but then how they relate to each other. And usually they're going to relate to each other in one of three ways. Either A, they're going to agree on the topic. B, they're going to agree on the topic, but there's going to be a shade of difference between them. So maybe they're going to agree on some things, but not on others. Or three, they're going to disagree. And that's pretty much it. Usually the passages are going to be, like I said, on the same topic, related. And it's your job to find what that relationship is because the dual questions will rely on that knowledge. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and work into this. So. We go right to the questions. Number seven, unlike the author of passage one, the author of passage two develops an argument by relying on. So this is a general to dual general. We're going to skip that. The phrase, it was no accident, implies that the author of passage one believes that Darwin. Okay, so we can do this one. So let's start reading. It was no accident that 19th century naturalist Charles Darwin strove to connect the mentality and emotionality of people with that of dogs, rather than say doves or horses. Neither his theory of evolution nor any general understanding of biology demanded that he preferentially underli underline our similarity to dogs over other species. But politically and emotionally, the choice was inevitable for an English gentleman who had set himself the task of making the idea of evolutionary continuity palatable. Darwin wrote that dogs possess something very similar to a conscience. They certainly possess some power of self-command. Dogs have long been accepted as the very type of fidelity and obedience. Okay, so what's going on here? So the author starts out by saying the important sentence. It was no accident that Charles Darwin strove to connect dogs with us. 
Neither his theory nor any understanding of biology demanded that he underline our similarities to dogs. And here's the key sentence, but politically and emotionally, the choice was inevitable for an English gentleman who had set himself the task of making the idea of evolutionary continuity palatable. So this is the idea that he would pick dogs because it was useful politically and emotionally trying to get his idea of evolution accepted. So he would use dogs um, to relate to other people to get them to believe it. So let's go to the choices. Um, implies that the author of Passage 1 believes that Darwin, A, knew that the resemblance between dogs and humans cannot be accounted for by his theories. So that's not mentioned anywhere. Uh, so we can get rid of that one. Um, exploited the sympathies of his audience to gain support for his theory. Not bad, right? Because, again, we have the sympathies, so this emotional aspect, uh, in order to gain support for his theory, and that's in the second part of that line where it says he had to... What was the line? Um, he had the task of making the idea of evolutionary continuity palatable, right? So acceptable. So that looks pretty good, so we'll leave that for now. Considered intelligence to be largely a matter of luck. They do not mention luck anywhere. Um, and perhaps a little bit literal. I think I mentioned it was literal. Yeah, it was no accident. So you might think, if you're reading this too literally and not carefully out of context, you might think, oh, it's no accident, so it wasn't a matter of luck. Uh, though this is the opposite of that. But So yeah, this one is a, is a obviously a stretch, but you can maybe see how they came up with it. Believe that the way previous authors had written about dogs was inaccurate. Uh, they don't mention that anywhere, that he believed that. Uh, wish to convince the public to celebrate the virtues of dogs. Again, don't mention that. So the best choice here is definitely B. In line 13, type most nearly means. Okay, so we can answer this. Let's start from line 10. Darwin wrote that dogs possess something very similar to a conscience. They certainly possess some power of self-command. Dogs have long been accepted as the very blank of fidelity and obedience. Um, well, how about, again, treat it like a sentence completion. How about example? Very example of fidelity and obedience. So category, does category mean like example? Uh, sort of, we'll leave that. We'll come back to it. Model, does that mean example? The model of, what was the line? The model of fidelity and obedience? Sure, right? The type, the model, the example. That's pretty good. The designation? No. The role? No. The figure? No. So we're stuck between A and B. Now category, now again, thinking about trap choices in the vocab and context questions, usually they'll take a word and use it as, so in this case, type. And they'll put in choices that are basic synonyms. So type and category are basic synonyms. But is it really capturing what's going on here? Uh, dogs have been accepted as the very something of fidelity and obedience. So they're an example, right? They are the, the, the um, if you think of fidelity and obedience, you think of dogs, right? They are that example, that model in this case. They're not the category. That's not quite right. So for that reason, we can get rid of A and go with B. So you can see this is an example. This one is, is rated a medium. It might be a hard medium, but... I don't, and for this test, they rated them only easy, medium, hard, not one, two, three, four, five. So we can't get the exact shade of it. But you can see why this one could be tough, why someone might be tempted to pick category, but it doesn't fit exactly. Uh, and always use that synonym trick to say, okay, is this just a, a basic synonym that doesn't really work in context? The italics in line 25 most directly emphasize. Okay, so here's an example, by the way, of where punctuation, where that break in the continuity, uh, where something stands out to you. Uh, because it's italicized, is something that the SAT mentions, and we talked about that before. So let's go up to line 25. Darwin was not alone in his beliefs that dogs possess human virtues. The characteristics of loyalty and obedience coupled with an expressive face and body can account for why dogs are such popular and valued pets in many cultures. Depending on the breed and the individual, dogs can be noble, charming, affectionate, and reliable. But while all dog owners should rightly appreciate these and other endearing traits in their pets, nothing says that the cleverness of a highly intelligent primate such as a chimpanzee is a part of the package. Scientists generally believe that reasoning, the reasoning abilities of chimps to be considerably greater than that of dogs. But many people nonetheless believe that dogs are smarter than chimps precisely because of our familiarity and emotional ties with the dogs that we love. So what is this italicized believe doing here in our own words? Well, it seems to be emphasizing that despite what the scientists, what kind of experts believe about intelligence, nonetheless, we still, there are many people out there who regardless will believe that their dogs are smarter than what science says. And they do it because uh, we love dogs and we have familiarity and emotional ties to them. So it's, it's, it's emphasizing that contrast between the beliefs. Um, most directly emphasize a misguided idea that is becoming obsolete. So this doesn't on the surface sound too bad. We'll come back to this. A negative view that scientists adopt towards lay people. No, they don't mention scientists being negative towards regular people. A common criticism of dog owners. That is not a criticism. They don't mention anything with criticism. 
the controversial nature of an alternative theory. Um, certainly it's an alternative theory, but why do they mention that it's necessarily controversial? And even if they did, again, the italics don't emphasize that. That's what the question wants to know, what the italics emphasize. Um, you know, the controversial nature, it could be true. I mean, it could be a controversial nature. Even if we granted it as true, it's still not what's being emphasized by the italics. The intensity of a conviction based on sentiment. So on the surface, it's not clear how this relates to anything, but let's see what it says. The intensity of a conviction or a belief based on sentiment, which is emotion. And that works pretty good, right? Because it's emphasizing that these people believe, again, that dogs are smarter because of our familiarity and emotional ties with the dogs that we love, right? So we believe nonetheless that dogs are smarter than chimps because of that emotional connection. So that actually works pretty good. Uh, so let's look at A again, a misguided idea that is becoming obsolete. So certainly this idea is misguided, at least with reference to the scientist's belief. Whether it's becoming obsolete or not is not mentioned. It doesn't mention at all that it's becoming out of fashion. In fact, it seems the opposite is true, that it's something that is staying in fashion regardless of what scientists believe. Um, and even if we did grant this, again, it's not what's being emphasized. What's being emphasized is this contrast between what scientists believe and what people believe and why people believe that they do so for emotional reasons. So we can get rid of A and we can go with E and that's the answer here. 11. In line 29, the author of passage 1 uses the word old to suggest that the story is... Okay. Uh, we apply the same secret rules to our fellow humans. The old in-group, out-group story. People in your in-group are those who are similar to you, either because they belong to the same organizations as you or enjoy the same activities, or, and this is the kicker, because they are simply around more often. Dogs, because of their proximity to their owners, are definitely in. Okay, so we apply the same secret rules to our fellow humans, the old, so the... How about like the standard, the well-known, right? The well-known, the standard in-group, out-group story, right? It's that story that we that applies in many different places that we've heard before that uh, is relevant for this case. So the familiar, yeah, right? It's the, it's the story that we've heard before that's well-known, so that looks pretty good. The historic, now historic might go with old in terms of a synonym, but they're not mentioning anything about history here. There's no sense that that's, that story, quote unquote, is historic, at least as mentioned by the passage. Fictitious, that's fake. Again, no mention that it's not a real story or not a real phenomenon. Tiresome, no mention of that. Outdated, again, kind of sim sim similar to old, but there's no mention that it's outdated or obsolete. Again, they have to mention that specifically. So familiar is going to be uh, the choice here. Darwin and Meek serve as examples of, okay, this is a detailed dual question. Um, you can see we have to compare what Darwin and Meek are. So we need something in passage one and something in passage two, and then get the answer. So we're gonna skip this one and come back to it. Uh, 13, in line 53, the author, okay, so this is a passage two, let's finish passage one quick. The intensity of our relationship with dogs causes us quite naturally to imbue them with high level mental abilities, whether they have earned those extra intelligence points or not. We like them, so we think well of them. Okay, uh, so let's go to 13. So we need, in line 53, the author of passage 2 uses quotation marks. Okay, very similar question to 10, which was about italic. This one's about quotation marks. So why does the author use quotation marks line 53? Every dog trainer that I know had the same childhood, a childhood filled with the brilliant, heroic dogs of literature. We read about dogs who regularly traveled thousands of miles to be reunited with owners who somehow misplaced... them, repeatedly saved people from certain death, and continually exhibited a better grasp of strategic problem solving than the average PhD. In the preface to one of his dog stories, S.P. Meek, a bit shamefacedly, remarked that in the writing of dogs, I endeavored to hold these heroes down to the level of canine intelligence and to make them above all believable. If at times I seem to have made them show super canine intelligence, it is because my enthusiasm has run away from me. We forgave him, of course. It was something of a shock, therefore to discover how the learning theory of experts believed dogs think and learn. I was told that dogs, unlike chimpanzees, have no real reasoning ability. Dogs don't think. Rather, they learn to avoid the unpleasant negative reinforcement, seek the pleasant positive reinforcement, or some combination of the two. To contend otherwise was to be guilty of the sin of anthropomorphizing, the attribution to an animal of motivations and consciousness that only a human being could possess. Okay, so what's going on with these quotes? Well, notice the author starts out by saying, um, basically extolling the virtues of dogs, right? Dogs are so great. They're so smart. They do all these 
great things. And then it transitions into, here's our contrast. It was something of a shock, therefore, to discover how the learning theory experts believe dogs think and learn. So one of the functions of quotes, besides to quote something, is it's how it's being used here. One of those functions is to cast doubt or skepticism or question the use of a term. So if you want to use the term expert, but you want to question it at the same time, you would use quotes. Sometimes they're called scare quotes. Scare quotes. Uh, so that's what this is doing, right? It's casting doubt on whether they're even experts because the author's going to go, along, go on to disagree with them. Express anger about a prevailing belief. Now, certainly the, the author might be might disagree, and certainly does disagree with the prevailing belief of the experts, but anger, not necessarily, that's not really supported, and that's not what the quotes are doing. The quotes are not explicitly showing that he or she is angry with the experts. Demonstrate respect for a certain group of scientists. No, this is the opposite. The opposite is the truth here. Uh, so we can get rid of that one. Indicate uncertainty about the precise usage of a word. Um, not bad. Close. Um, but it's more about the author knows the usage of the word that they want to use, and that is questioning it. So they know what the word means. The author knows what the word means and is kind of denying that by using the quotes because the author doesn't think that they're experts at all because he thinks that they're wrong. Cite the term cite a term used in an unusual context. There's no sense here that the context is unusual. It seems quite con usual. Cast doubt on the aptness of a description. Yeah, like how appropriate that description is. Yep, perfect. Again, the author does not want to um, see that these people are actually experts because the author disagrees strongly with what they're saying. The experts would most likely argue that which of the following is guilty of the sin mentioned in line 58. This is an example of an analogous question, even though it doesn't have analogous, even though it doesn't have the word in it, because we need to see which of the following random cases is most like the cases set out, uh, most like the example that's set out in the passage. So let's go back to that sin. To contend otherwise was to be guilty of the sin of anthropomorphizing, the attribution to an animal of motivations and consciousness that only a human being could possess. So what is a sin? It's anthropomorphizing. It's giving human emotions and traits to animals. So let's see, a veterinarian who is unwilling to treat a sick animal. Now it has to do, notice all these are going to be topical. So for that reason, they all have to do with animals. So that doesn't really cut the fold, cut, cut it down for any of us. So we got to get into the specifics. Now, this is not anthropomorphizing. It's just a vet not caring for a cat or an animal. Not relevant. A cat owner who believes his cat misses its siblings. Yeah, this is anthropomorphizing, right? You're, you're uh, putting human emotions, folding them onto a cat. Whether or not the cat does, I mean, maybe it does, but we don't know. So this is anthropomorphizing. So this looks good. A dog owner who is unwilling to punish her dog for misbehaving. Not relevant. A zoologist who places the interests of people before those of animals? Nope. A horse trainer who fails to recognize that his horse is hungry? No. The only one that's anthropomorphizing is B. Both the author of passage 1 and the experts mentioned in passage two, uh, 53 of passage 2 directly support the idea that... Uh, so we could actually do this one now, even though it's a detailed duel. This is where sometimes you can get into the uh, flexibility of the technique. We can do this one now because it's just talking about passage 1, which we've read, and the experts in passage two, which we've just read as well. Remember, the experts believe that um, we anthropomorphize animals, and that's why we think that they're smart, or at least in this case, dogs. Uh, and the author passage one believes that we think dogs are more intelligent than they are because we connect with them emotionally. So it has to do, both of them believe um, that we think dogs are intelligent because of our emotional connection to them, because of how close we are with them and the traits we ascribe to them. So let's look at the choices. Writers of dog stories intentionally distort the truth for dramatic purposes. Now, that is completely out of left field. Notice they do mention dog stories in passage two, so this is kind of a recycled words error. Uh, but again, passage one certainly doesn't mention that, and it's just not relevant. Comparing the intelligence of dogs to that of chimps is a pointless enterprise. So they both mention comparing dogs to chimps and their intelligence, but to say it's pointless is contradictory, right? It, it has a point. The whole point is to compare them to see which is smarter. So to say that that's a pointless enterprise is not, not quite right. Many people have an excessive emotional attachment to their dogs. Now, this one looks close, right? Because it's talking about that emotional attachment. But is it excessive? Do they tell that it's excessive? No, they're overall pretty positive towards our emotional attachment. But they just say that emotional attachment leads us to ascribe intelligence to dogs where maybe they don't have it. So this is a close one. This is one of those really tight, uh, maybe if you've been stuck between this one and another one. Um, certainly, if it said many people have an emotional attachment to their dogs, I mean, it's right. The word excessive alone, that one word, is enough to kill the choice. So we can get rid of C. 
dogs are less intelligent than many people believe. Yeah, uh, both pa- both the authors, the author of passage one, and the experts would believe that, right? People think dogs are intelligent, but you know what? Once you get past your biases, biases, you'll find they're not as intelligent as you think. So that looks good. Few people are familiar with learning theory as it applies to dogs. They do mention learning theory, but they don't mention how many people know it. So D is the best answer. Based on lines 63 to 67, the author of passage 2 would most likely appear to the author of passage 1 as... Okay, so we can't quite do this one yet. We'll come back to it. Uh, We can actually maybe potentially do it because... Let's actually do 17 first because it's up to 67 to 68. So we want to know what do the lines here principally serve to do? What are their function? So... Start from here. Yet as a dog trainer, I find myself siding more with the meeks than I do with the learning theorists. Nobody could believe dispassionately in the totality of positive and negative reinforcement after seeing the pure intelligence shining in the face of a dog of a border collie intent upon helping a shepherd herd sheep. Dogs do think and reason. Granted, a dog might not be able to run a maze as quickly as a chimp. Here is the important part. But a dog outshines any other animal that I know in the ability to work willingly with a human being to communicate with a puzzling creature who often makes incomprehensible demands. So let's stop there. Why does the author mention, granted a dog might not be able to run a maze as quickly as a chimp? The key word here is granted, right? Um, the author is granting something. The author is making a concession. The author is saying, yeah, I know. It's true. You might say that um, a chimpanzee would be would do better in a maze. Uh, than a dog. Yeah, sure, that's that's true. I'll grant you that. So the author's conceding something here and trying to head off that possible objection, but still trying to then support his or her point. So it's some it's basically heading off an objection. Um, acknowledge a flaw in a prevalent theory. So this one's close, right? Because it is a flaw in a theory, but is it a prevalent theory? I mean, it's not exactly clear that it's prevalent um, because. Um, Certainly the author believes it, and other people might believe it, but how prevalent it is, it's not really supported. We can't really say for sure how prevalent it might be. Um, so we can probably get rid of A. We'll see what else there is, though. Digress from a primary claim. They're not digressing here. Evoke an air of mystery? No way. Uh, dismiss a scientific hypothesis as unfounded? No. They're just, as I said, modifying their position, showing one particular weakness for their position, but still giving uh, reason as to why that doesn't matter. Anticipate a possible objection to an argument. Exactly. So if we're stuck between A and E, I think E is the better answer here. Just because, notice we have this word principally. So the principal reason, sure, I guess we can, even if we grant that the author is acknowledging the flaw in her theory, which he or she is in this case, um, to say that's the principal thing that's going on here is not is not quite true because the function of this is to say, well, listen, I know this is not quite right, but even still, I, I think this is true. So the author is like is is heading off any objections, trying to say yes, I I know, I know, I know, but this is the case. So that's why E is the best answer. Eighteen. The authors of both passages mention chimpanzees in order to. Okay, this one is a duel. We'll come back to it. How do the authors of two? Okay, another duel. So let's just go ahead and finish the passage, and then we can do all the rest of the questions. But a dog outshines any other animal that I know in the ability to work willingly with a human being, to communicate with a puzzling creature who often makes incomprehensible demands. Researchers have increasingly come to view intelligence as a complex collection of mental abilities that cannot be fully captured in any simple way. Dogs are geniuses at being useful, and it is this usefulness that we admire when we praise their intelligence. As Jonica Newby, a a specialist in animal-human interaction, writes, in some ways, intelligence is a matter of matching behavior to environment. To compare intelligence in creatures that have evolved differently is a bit like deciding which has hit upon the best mode of travel, the dolphin or the horse. And it is dogs, not chimps, who possess the most helpful mode of travel for humans. Okay, unlike the author of Passage 1, the author of Passage 2 develops an argument by relying on. So, okay, this is one of those fact finding questions, which you really can't come up with your own answer first. It's better for this just to look at the choices uh, and see which one fits best. Uh... So again, this is not the primary thing we want to do. Most of the time, we do want to come up with our own answer, but be flexible. If you can't come up with your own answer, just go to the choices. This is not like a hard and fast rule that you must always follow. In this case, it's best just to go and look at the choices. Uh, Personal experience. Um, Well, certainly, Passage 2 talks about personal experience. uses I. Passage 1 doesn't really use personal experience, so that looks pretty good. Uh, Scientific observation. Um, They both seem to use scientific observation, or maybe even just one. But in any event, not quite relevant. Historical contextualization. Uh, that's actually in one, right? In one, they talk about history. 
In two, they do not. We're looking for what's in two, but not in one. Statistical evidence, that's not, I don't think that's in either. So yeah, that's in neither. So that's not going to be it. Direct quotation. Um, uh, n I think both of them use direct quotation, right? Um, end of this paragraph and the end of this paragraph right here and this right here. So they both use direct quotation. So we're, only one that's in two, but not in one is A. Uh, 12. What do Darwin and Meek serve as examples of? Well, let's see. Darwin was talking about um, how we think dogs are so smart. Um, they possess something similar to conscience. They possess power of self-command. They're the very type of fidelity and obedience. And he did this because politically and emotionally, the choice was inevitable for an English gentleman. So there's a sense that he is um, giving, again, Herman here uh, human virtues to the dogs whereas meeks did the kind of same thing so both of them are thinking dogs are really smart pretty much so let's go to the choices writers who had the courage to voice unpopular view viewpoints this is an example of maybe true in real life but not true for the sat darwin's viewpoints were certainly uh unpopular but not relevant here researchers who conducted important studies on animal behavior uh you might stretch to say darwin did but certainly meeks didn't meeks just wrote dog stories People who maliciously publicize misleading information. No, there's no, nothing malicious about that. Individuals whose writings reflect an idealized view of dog behavior. Yep, that looks good. Scientists who are authorities on the issue of animal intelligence. Um, certainly Darwin was a scientist and maybe he was an authority, but again, Meeks wasn't. So D is the best answer. Let's move on to, make sure I'm not missing any, 16. <clears throat> Based on line 63 to, let me get this out of the way. Based on line 63 to 67, the author of passage two would most likely appear to the author of passage one as, let's see, 63 to 67. Um, nobody could believe dispassionately in the totality of positive and negative reinforcement after seeing the pure intelligence shining in the face of a border collie, intent upon helping a shepherd herd sheep. Dogs do think and reason. So this person is doing what passage one accuse people of doing author passage one accused people of giving intelligence to dogs based off our emotional connection to them uh but um and that's exactly what passage two was doing right oh I, I look in the eyes of a border collie and i see how smart she looks so oh boy she's right that's exactly what so passage two is doing exactly what passage one says that they do um appear to author passage one as a neutral observer of animal behavior no the opposite is true in that case, well-informed concerning research to animal intelligence, maybe the opposite, because again, the author might, a passage one might say, you don't know the science behind it. Though, I mean, obviously passage one, passage two does, they do talk about it earlier, but in any event, having a deep fondness for border collies and therefore overestimating them. Yep. The author of passage two likes them so much that he or she ascribes intelligence where maybe there isn't any. Having little respect for traditional scientific research. So certainly the author is a passage two is skeptical of the typical uh, theories, but to say that the author has little respect, especially in the eyes of passage one, is not really supported. Having a narrow understanding of what constitutes intelligence, um, not quite. Um, in fact, passage two would probably say that about passage one, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So that's more like the wrong passage. In the dual passage questions, make sure you're not attributing the belief to the wrong passage. They'll do that sometimes. They'll kind of mix who thinks what, and you got to keep that straight. All right, 18. The authors of both passages mention chimpanzees in order to, well, just thinking back to what we read, they mentioned chimpanzees in order to set, to compare the, the intelligence to dogs, right? To set the standard of, okay, chimps are really smart, so how smart are dogs compared to chimps? So let's look at the choices. Suggest that the public has a distorted view of chimpanzee intelligence. Uh, where do they mention that? Compare the emotions of primates to dogs. Okay, so this looks pretty good, right? We're comparing primates to dogs. So wait a minute, emotions? We're not comparing emotions, we're comparing intelligence. So do not get sucked in by the one word. This is a classic half-right question where you really want to pick it because it fits well, but that one word emotions throws it all off. Justify the beliefs of the public regarding the intelligence of certain animals. Um, no. Uh, because they're not, let's see, justify the beliefs of the public regarding, yeah, I mean, they're not trying to justify the beliefs of the public. In fact, they're almost trying to, in some cases, uh, in the case of passage one, uh, contradict those beliefs of, of the general public. Criticize an eccentric scientific claim about animal intelligence. No, there's nothing eccentric there. 
provide an example of an animal considered to be highly intelligent. Yep. So we pick the chimp because it's a good model against which to measure the dog. Last question. How do the authors of the two passages differ in their assumptions about animal intelligence? Okay, so sometimes assumptions questions can be hard to come up with your own answer as well. So we're not going to come up with our own answer for this one. Let's just go to the choices and see what we got. The author of passage one implies that intelligence is a single entity. Okay, I mean, the author definitely seems to do that, right? Mentions, you know, um, let's see. What's the part about the chimps? Uh, da, 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 da. Can't seem to find the part about the chimps. Yeah, um, nothing says that the cleverness of a highly intelligent primate such as chimpanzee is part of the package. Um, extra intelligence points. So the author is, I guess, there's nothing wrong with saying the author thinks intelligence is one thing. Whereas the author of Passage 2 suggests that intelligence can be demonstrated in many distinct ways. Yeah, that's what's going on in this last part, right? Uh, where they have researchers have found that intelligence is a complex collection of mental abilities. Um, so yeah, that looks pretty good. So we'll keep A. The author of Passage 2 1 believes that no animal can be considered truly intelligent. Where does the author say that? So we can even get rid of B without checking the second part because that whole thing is off. If one part is wrong, it's just like the sentence completions. If half of it is wrong, all of it is wrong. Right? To think of this as like a two-blanker. The author of Passage 1 believes that intelligence can be measured. Uh, I, maybe. Whereas the author of Passage 2 believes that such quantification would be unethical. Where does the author mention quantification? Where does it mention unethical? Nowhere. The author of Passage 1 suggests that intelligence is innate, whereas the author of Passage 2 argues that it is acquired. None of them mentions that. This is an example of something you might bring from real life, because this is an argument that people have in real life about if intelligence is innate or acquired. Um... So don't bring it in from real life because that's not what's mentioned here. The author of Passage 1 considers intelligence to be developed over time, whereas the author of Passage 2 shows that it's largely static. Again, you might bring that in from real life, but not mentioned. So the answer here is definitely A. And that is our dual passage. So you work it through like that. Specific 1, general 1, specific 2, general 2, dual. And if you follow it that closely, uh, you should do it as efficiently as possible. Okay, let's move on to do a fiction passage. To learn more about Reason Prep's SAT, SAT subject test, and ACT video courses, go to reasonprep.com slash enroll, and you can find the link in the description below the video.